Welcome to South Coast Working, the voice of working people and those who continue to build the South Coast each and every day. From the docks, to the mills, to the classrooms, to the roadways, working people add a voice and life to Southeastern Massachusetts. Brought to you by the UMass Dartmouth Arnold M. Dubin Labor Education Center. Hello, and welcome to the UMass Dartmouth Labor Education Center's podcast series. On this episode, you'll be hearing from me, Liz Anasaskis. I'm a senior at UMass Dartmouth, and I've always had a passion for public transportation. On this podcast episode, we'll be talking about the South Coast Rail, which will finally connect the South Coast community with Boston via train. But we can't talk about the rail without also talking about other forms of local transit that are needed to connect community members to the commuter rail. To learn more about the bus system that creates important connections to rail, we'll hear about the work of local leaders from New Bedford and Fall River, whose efforts led to changes in the hours of bus services and prevented a hike in fare. Without buses to get people to and from the commuter rail station, access to the commuter rail is more limited. The two community leaders you'll hear from today both express the importance of ensuring that other forms of local transit are connected to the commuter rail. First, we'll hear from Siggy Malis, a fellow alumni from UMass Dartmouth, who talks about her efforts organizing transit riders in 2016 and how a commuter rail might have impacted her work at the time. Then, we'll hear from Eric Carvalho, president of the Amalgamated Transit Union in Fall River, about the importance of connecting buses and other forms of local transportation with the plans for the commuter rail extension project. Finally, we'll hear a brief interview from Nadine, a PCA from Wareham, about how her ride might change when the commuter rail comes to New Bedford. Through these interviews and stories, I hope that you too will gain a new passion for public transportation and gain a better understanding of the importance of connecting the South Coast community to Boston and other prosperous economic centers across Massachusetts. First, we'll hear from Siggy Malis, who, as a student and part-time worker in New Bedford in 2016, organized other transit riders to fight for an extension of bus services into the evening and prevented a rise in fares. My name is Siggy Malis, and um, I'm a former uh, transit rider organizer in New Bedford. Siggy explained how her work organizing transit riders in the South Coast connected to advocacy efforts in Boston that required people to go to Boston. Her stories about the difficult commute to Boston given the limitations emphasize the need for other options such as the commuter rail. So in in my work um, with Bus Riders United, which was a transit rider advocacy organization that I was a part of, um, we often would go to the state house to visit with legislators or um, public hearings that might be happening around public transit funding um, or statewide coalition events. And it was, it was difficult. We'd always um, have to create our own modes of transportation to get there because we lacked a reliable public transit option. I know there's private buses that go up there. Um, We would often take charter buses or arrange carpools in order to do that. Um, The drive itself isn't, isn't the best. Um, Or we'd also drive part way to meet up with um, the T in, in Quincy um, sometimes, but yeah, uh, commuting up into Boston um, is, is a difficult thing to do either by car or bus. Um, and having that option of a rail down here would both, you know, help bring folks up to Boston to engage uh, in the political center of the state um, and also, you know, increase mobility between the region. As a student at UMass Dartmouth, heavily engaged in state politics, I know exactly what Siggy's talking about when she says it's difficult to organize group trips to Boston. I've gone on trips to Boston where we've had to limit the number of students that can attend advocacy days because there weren't enough students with cars to drive everyone to Lakeville Station. I've also had to wake up very early in the morning to hop on a school bus so that we can beat rush hour traffic. I know many students that live in or around Boston that rush to the bus stop when they leave for spring break because there are only so many seats on the bus that departs from school and there is always a long line of students trying to get home. She goes on to further discuss the importance of local transit options like buses to enhance mobility within the region, which has a tremendous impact on the workers of the community. So uh, back when I was working in the area, um, I was a bus 
I was a bus rider and I was also a restaurant worker. And uh, during that time, uh, there was no bus service after six o'clock and no bus service on Sundays. So that greatly impacted my ability as a a public transit dependent restaurant worker uh, to access steady employment and also access uh, steady transportation to and from work um, because it wasn't, you know, when my shifts were, when I'd be scheduled for, wouldn't always match up uh, to when the service was available. and I was also a student at the time at UMass Dartmouth um, and lived off campus uh, my senior year and relied on public transit to get to and from campus. Um, so during that time, um, the there were some issues um, for folks like me to be able to uh, engage in activities after six o'clock at night and on the weekends, um, take jobs that were kind of outside of the window of when when service was. And really when we were organizing uh, back in the day, that, that was our main focus, um, being able to meet the needs of the existing population in um, most New Bedford and Fall, Rivers, Fall River and the cities and towns in between. Um, And I I want to highlight that in terms of the commuter rail, because I think um, in my experience, both organizing for transit locally in New Bedford and um, other places across the country, um, when we talk about expanding rail, um, sometimes there isn't a focus on also you know, who's who's using the rail and and what's it for. And um, a lot of times uh, rail prioritizes um, more affluent whiter communities and their transportation needs. And I felt like that could possibly be um, a situation we would run into have the commuter rail come down um, from Boston that yes, it would be great to have uh, access to Boston and folks being able to, to travel, whether it be for work or education um, up and down Southeastern Massachusetts. Um, But it was also something that we wanted to focus on is who the service would be for. Who would the service be for? If this commuter rail is going to connect workers with employment opportunities or community members with new businesses or new healthcare opportunities, then it needs to be accessible to people that don't own cars, can't afford an Uber or a Lyft, or that have children that need car seats not typically found in Uber and Lyfts. Siggy's point about emphasizing the need for new transit opportunities to be connected with current transit options is vital to ensuring these new services really are for everyone. She further clarifies her point by bringing the conversation back to weekend services, something she fought to make the buses offer in 2016. Um, And knowing that we would need to greatly, greatly increase both uh, frequency, routes, um, and affordability in our region just with the local bus service before we could even think about um, bringing a rail down here. Because if we had a rail, we wouldn't... Just my assumptions, uh, the rail wouldn't stop running at six o'clock. The rail would probably run on the weekends. Um, But if you didn't have a local bus service that connected to that, who was the rail for? Folks that could drive to a train station from a suburb, a a wealthier community and hop on a train, you know, or was it really going to be for um, the workers and students um, and folks who relied on the local bus service to meet their needs, their their way to get to the doctors or the grocery store or to work or to school or for recreation to go visit all the great museums and parks and restaurants that we have to offer in in this region. Um, So I think that when we're talking about the commuter rail and what my experience was back then organizing around it, um, there was skepticism of who would, would this development benefit the folks who already lived and relied on the local transit system or would it um, unfortunately be used as a way to bring uh, folks from richer communities into an area where rent was still pretty affordable and um, just, you know, and then everything that comes from a, a increasing um, transportation for these types of uh, communities, um, which you can 
which rising housing costs and unfortunately gentrification that uh, is can be harmful in a way because it could lead to displacement of folks who uh, can no longer live in an area because something like a commuter rail uh, came down um, came down to, to, to New Bedford, which uh, isn't a reason not to build the rail, but these are things that, you know, as, as a group and an organization that was focused on um, increasing local bus service were concerns that uh, we wanted to make sure our elected officials and folks who were making the decisions about uh, the commuter rail took into account um, who the service would be for, how it would connect to the local system, and making sure that any uh, public transit improvements like a commuter rail would also um, coincide with um, really, really uh, focusing on improving the existing bus service so that the two worked to get together and um, service was expanded uh, for buses. Siggy talks a bit about her work in 2016 organizing transit riders here, but the work that the coalition of leaders across the South Coast did to rally around local transit was so instrumental in laying a foundation to ensure accessible public transportation, so I asked her to expand upon her work. So I worked in a coalition with uh, transit riders and bus drivers. Um, and my main focus was organizing transit riders to improve change. Though so we did talk to bus drivers and um, did build relationships with them as well, but they very much so organized uh, their own, their own, uh, their own folks. Sneak preview. Next, we'll be hearing from Eric Carvalho, a bus driver in Fall River and president of the ATU who led some of those organizing efforts Siggy is talking about. But we came together collectively to expand service um, and make the system work um, better for for folks for folks in the area. So some of the things that we focused on were expanding service into the evening, and we were able to expand service um, by a few hours on some the main artery routes in in both New Bedford and Fall River. Um, we were able to lower fares. Uh, and create a flat fare system and um, which there used to be a complicated zone system that you had to pay every few miles depending on predetermined markers of fare zones um, which was just hard to hard to navigate um, and also cost prohibitive it was it was a bit expensive to ride. Um, but after some hard work, we were able to get lower student fare passes, um, a flat fare um, that got you from A to B, um, which included a free transfer, which was which was a great victory. Um, we also stopped a fare hike on um, the paratransit services, uh, which was primarily utilized by um, older folks and people with disabilities. These successes are so important in understanding the context behind the South Coast's relationship with transportation. When people come together to fight for better services that center the needs of the communities, they win. And these wins create more opportunities for workers in the area who rely on these transit systems. In highlighting these victories, it becomes more evident that when public transportation works for the people, entire communities benefit. Siggy and other local leaders' advocacy efforts opened doors for student workers, employees that worked past 6 p.m., and families that may have been struggling with threats of fare hikes. From my perspective, I think the biggest challenges would be that piece around um, would bringing down a c commuter rail be negatively impacting um, a community because rail... Um, generally does cater to more affluent, um, higher educated um, folks. But with that said, I will say that the, the way as it is now, it's it's difficult if you do need to go, or if you, you want to go to Boston to go to one of the many great universities that are there or any other of the other things that Boston has to offer, um, high-end medical um, services that may not be available locally, a lot of really great hospitals in the area, but, you know, specialty, specialty doctors and things like that. Um, I could see that as being a really great benefit 
um, for folks. And also that New Bedford is a really great community to live and raise a family, very vibrant um, and rich history and community. Um, and having the ability to live somewhere more affordably and travel to a place that has more economic opportunity would be a benefit for, for New Bedford. Um, but yeah, and in, increasing the access for folks down here who have been kind of shut out of that economy um, would be important too. So yeah, accessing uh, education, accessing healthcare, because right now either, you know, trying to coordinate a ride or take a, um, take a private bus that's only on certain, a certain schedule is, is difficult right now. So having more flexibility of like a rail that runs more frequently um, would be beneficial for the area. Part of these wins should also be accredited to local leaders like Eric Carvalho, president of the ATU, who we'll hear from now. Eric Carvalho has been a bus driver for over 20 years, and during our interview, he continued to express his excitement for the opportunities that will become available to the South Coast community members with the addition of a commuter rail. My name is Eric Cavallo. I'm the president of business agent for ATU Local 174. It's the Amalgamated Transit Union in uh, Fall River, Massachusetts. I represent the bus operators and maintenance workers at the Southeastern Regional Transit Authority in uh, South Coast Transit Management, who's the management company for the authority. Uh, I've been president for it's my 13th year. I've worked the authority, this is my 23rd year. So uh, been involved for a long time. I've seen the, seen the service uh, grow over the last uh, decade or so, which has been good. Knowing that Eric has worked in the South Coast for so many years, I asked him about how long he's been hearing about plans for a commuter rail that will reach the South Coast. This commuter rail discussion has been going on well before my career at the Authority, and, and it's been ongoing uh, throughout my career. Uh, so for 20 plus years, we've heard, you know, different levels of discussion. And, you know, you hear the talk, you hear the talk and then kind of go away for a while. But over the last several years, uh, it's been some serious conversation. There's a lot of investment going on around the area, so which is a really good sign that it's going to finally happen, hopefully in the next few years. And it is. According to the MBTA website, part one of the South Coast Rail Project should connect Taunton, New Bedford, and Fall River to Boston by 2023. So here's to two more years of construction, after which we can all celebrate a new commuter rail. Keeping in mind the sentiments that Siggy shared about how vital the connections between the commuter rail and the bus system are, I asked Eric about whether his work within the ATU has been connected to some of the development plans for the commuter rail. Uh, ATU hasn't had any direct conversation on that. We, we've been kept in the loop a little bit. Um, I'm hoping to have more discussion, more serious discussion as construction progresses and uh, as, as we get a little closer to, to seeing that really come through. Um, but again, we are kept in a loop, but not in a real serious role right now. Then I ask Eric how he expects the commuter rail to impact his work the most. His first answer, job creation. I definitely think it's going to be a job creator. Uh, I can see a demand for it. And of course, that demand is just going to uh, make us busier, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, I mean, that, that's what we do. I mean, we, we get people from point A to point B. We get people from point A to point B. This may seem simple, but when point A is a five minute walk from home and point B is the grocery store, this simple concept is the only connection keeping food on people's plates. The work of bus drivers is often overlooked, but when you take a minute to think about how crucial their role is in ensuring people make it to work on time, are able to go to the grocery store, and now with future plans for connection to the commuter rail, people have a chance to make point B extend beyond their hometown. Now, point B could be a trip to specialized healthcare providers in Boston, a job interview for an opportunity someone once thought was inaccessible to them, and so much more. And uh, we're hoping that the commuter rail is going to really be uh, some people are going to take advantage of. And um, if we're going to be transporting of folks from Boston, that whole area, uh, that Boston area, you know, they heavily rely on uh, public transit and and we're ready to provide that service. 
Eric also talked about the coalitions within the South Coast that have advocated for improved services that support the needs of community members. Many of the sentiments Siggy had shared with me were echoed by Eric. The thing that really stood out to me was how Eric mentioned that the advocacy he has done was for and because of the riders. Centering the voices and needs of the riders has remained a constant theme when Eric and Siggy talked about previous organizing efforts around changing local transit systems, and I hope that the needs of community members continue to be centered in plans for the commuter rail. Work has already begun to ensure that community members are able to share their thoughts, questions, comments, and concerns with organizers, as the New Bedford Department of City Planning hosted a public meeting in January of 2020 to solicit feedback for the transit-oriented development study they created. You know, we've shown through our coalition building over the years with Bus Riders United and uh, and the Labor Ed Center and stuff like that. Uh, I. I think we know our passengers and what their needs have been. We've been able to advocate for them uh, at that level for a nice service and holiday service. You know, I'm happy to say we, we've been a voice for our passengers and uh, you know, we seem to work well with them. They come to us and they let us know what they'd like to see. And, and we try and advocate for that. So I think having us at the table, I think that's our biggest task right now. When these plans start happening, you know, let us have that input and, uh, you know, provide that input to make it work, you know. Recognizing the impact of COVID-19 on ridership among buses and trains across the nation, I asked Eric two questions. The first was about how COVID-19 has impacted his work directly. And second, how he expects the commuter rail to impact ridership of buses. Yeah, uh, I mean, before the pandemic, we've seen a steady increase in ridership uh, for the last several years. Um, ridership was really good. Uh, then the pandemic hit, obviously, I mean, people were working from home, schools were closed. I mean, school is a big part of our ridership in Fall River. Um, so it's definitely taken a hit. Uh, it's probably knocked probably down 50% or better at the at the worst of it i mean it was still still pretty low uh but it has gone up a little bit uh i think uh again as things start coming around you're going to slowly start seeing that increase especially as schools uh in, you know in person learning starts happening again um i think it'll get back uh it had you know we did have a reduced service for quite a while early on uh we didn't have any layoffs, thankfully. Uh, we did have a reduction of service and uh, we alternated some of our, our, our shifts. You know, we did some things to maintain and we, we got through it with no layoffs, thank God. Um, but uh, again, I think it's gonna turn around. Uh, it's gonna head in the right direction. I think commuter rail is gonna be, like I said earlier, gonna be a, a, a plus. Um, people gonna be able to get on the bus, get on a shuttle or whatever they plan on doing. They're going to be able to get right to the station and uh, go do what they have to do in Boston, whether it be a doctor's appointment, a job, or just go out there for the day. Finally, we'll hear from Nadine. Nadine is a worker from Wareham who uses the bus to get to Boston multiple times a week. This interview was conducted in the middle of a bus station, so I'm warning you now that you may hear a bit of background noise. And so what is your name? Nadine. Nadine. And have you lived in New Bedford your whole life? No, actually I'm from Wareham. Okay. How often do you use the bus to Boston? Twice a week. Twice a week. And what kind of trips do you take to Boston? Um, I'm from both, actually, personal and work. Yeah, yeah. can you talk to us more about that? Like, how... yeah, I'm a PCA. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm on my way to work. Okay. I'll stay overnight and then I catch the 7 o'clock bus back home wow. the next morning. Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard about the commuter rail that's coming to New Bedford? Yeah, I've been hearing about that like 20 years ago. I'm still waiting. Yeah. Kind of using the commuter rail pretty frequently? Most likely. Yeah. Um, how do you think the commuter rail will kind of impact the community of New Bedford and your commute to work as a PCA? I think it will create more jobs, first of all, for that line running from here to Boston. It will make your trip a lot quicker. It, I think it just will benefit everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. No. Nadine's excitement about the commuter rail coming to the South Coast was shared not only by me, but by Eric, who is looking forward to the first time the train rides into the South Coast. I'm looking forward to that day when the train comes into town and, you know, does that first trip. You know, um, I, I am. I'm really looking forward to it. And 
I'm really optimistic it's going to be a positive thing. I, for one, cannot wait to hear the whistle of the train as it rolls into New Bedford for the very first time because I know what the train means to the South Coast community. So many opportunities will be open for people as long as local transit is connected to the commuter rail. As 2023 draws closer, what many thought would remain a dream will soon become a reality for community members in Taunton, New Bedford, and Fall River. Until then, support your local bus drivers and riders, and thank you for tuning in to this episode of the UMass Dartmouth Labor Education Center's podcast. I want to give a tremendous thank you to the many folks that were involved in bringing this podcast episode to life, including Kim Wilson, Camille Viveros, Jim Snow, Stephen, Faith, and Isaac Dubin from the UMass Dartmouth Labor Education Center, and Juliana Bradley, as well as Siggy, Eric, and Nadine for sitting down for an interview with me. Each of these folks has been instrumental in supporting me in the process of creating this podcast, so thank you to each and every one of you.